So I think. Um, so there are rules of the game, <laughs> um, and I'll uh, get to explaining them in a second. They're not complicated, or um, yeah, they're not going to be too hard. I'm going to just uh, briefly uh, introduce all our speakers. Then each um, um, one of us is going to say a word about their own work on the Binding of Isaac, maybe five minutes, something like that, just a very brief introduction. Um, that's going to be difficult. <laughs> and um, then I'm going uh, to allow Jim um, to basically start a conversation, maybe ask a few questions. Um, each of us, and then try to make us argue. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I haven't spoken to Jim about this. I'm sure that he will find a way to allow also people oh, absolutely. Um, you know, from around the table to ask questions and to participate. So please do that uh, too. Um, I decided on the subway to, to maybe begin with a word of vanity and to tell you a story about myself. <laughs> I used to be obsessed about the story of the Binding of Isaac. I pretty, uh, pretty mean that when I say obsessed, as in not sleeping at night. And I thought that by publishing an article about this, I will, I will get rid of the obsession. And uh, I published one article, I didn't get rid of the obsession. Then I published a second, and I didn't get rid of the obsession. Then I published a book, and I did get rid of it. <laughs> and then I came to the new school. <laughs> and uh, so the book was, I mean, I, I was done with the book in 2005, and it came out a couple of years after that. And uh, so it's been a while. And then I came to the new school, and it became clear that two things. First, there is room for that um, interest of mine within a philosophy department, which is not an obvious thing at all. Mm -hmm. And not just room, but also a demand for the relevance of that story uh, within a philosophy department. And that was a great thing. Um, so I'm glad that this worked out on the occasion of Jim's new book. Um, but where is the lamb? The five most terrifying um, <laughs> words in the uh, Hebrew Bible, possibly. No, in Hebrew it's not five. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. In the Robert Alter <laughs> translation of the Hebrew Bible. Right. <laughs> it took me a while to recognize it. Yes. In yeah, Hebrew, there's right. no but. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> well, then four was right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, great. But I'm glad that we um, get a chance to do that. Um, James Goodman, I know him as uh, Jim, just published this book already available, um, but where is a lamb? Five words or less, <laughs> you choose. Uh, it came out with Shokin. Jim is a professor of history and the head of the nonfiction writing in the MFA program at Rutgers. Um, he is um, the author of Blackout, among others, which was finalist to the Pulitzer Prize. Um, Yael Feldman is a professor at um, NYU. Um, she is the author, most recently, of uh, Glory and Agony, Isaac's Sacrifice, a National uh, Narrative. I just, just wore the uh, cover. <laughs> it's much lighter. She brought the cover, I brought the book. <laughs> um, that came out in, in 2010. Um, Jay doesn't need much of an introduction um, in this field. Um, he's a university distinguished, distinguished professor of philosophy at the New School for Social Research. Um, he's currently writing a book, for those of you who don't know, um, on torture and dignity. Um, yeah, yeah. do you want to be the first to go and uh, say a few words about Oh, oh, I, thought, words I, about thought, oh, I, yeah. I was preparing to be the last one, so you are caught Should I go surprise. first? <laughs> okay? It's your... <laughs> go first. Me? Oh, I'm really, okay. Okay, so uh, as I said, I was going to say that uh, um, uh, Omri said that he was trying to get rid of stuff uh, by writing, and uh, I guess all of us uh, were trying to do the same. It's a very uh, disturbing uh, story, and it has a very disturbing, even more disturbing than that we all knew, I think, when we started uh, history, as uh, we can see in the, in the, in the new book. Um, 
but I must say that I, uh, uh, and yes, and I want to say it's endless. We, we, we have here an, uh, an example. What, uh, what is it? The, the this week's New Yorker, a joke with Abraham and Isaac, and the punchline is, must I sacrifice family for career? <laughs> and Sarah is not there. And Sarah is not there. <laughs> Even he, though the line sounds... Secrets <laughs> kept. Secrets kept. <laughs> okay, so the story is never over. But I suspect that the timing, at least of the three books that uh, are already out, is very clear. And it is post 9-11. Uh, so this we share, and I think um, lots of people share uh, about that. And it's, I, it's clear in all the, the, when you read the three books, it's, it's clearly there. But I must uh, say that my story started way before that. Uh, um, and I do come, and uh, not that I'm a psychoanalyst, but I did come to, I know that I do, I did come to it from the perspective of the psycholo psychology, not psychoanalysis, but the psychology of what I, the, the patriarchal stories in general. And uh, that was in the 90s. Uh, I was studying psychoanalysis, and I was really struck and maybe disturbed by the differences between what I read in Freud and what I felt that the family dynamics in Genesis is all about, which is very little about father and son and a lot about siblings, which leads me to what I want to talk today here in a few minutes, which is impossible, but I will try, is about siblings. And what I'm doing here, uh, uh, Jean talks a lot about revisions, that the whole history is really a revision of this early story, the biblical story. I use the, more the word rewriting, and you got me thinking, I mean, what's the difference? What do we mean by revision? What do we mean by rewriting? Sometimes I use the, the word subversion. Uh, in, uh, according to the case. And um, I, I, I feel that uh, the one of the things that really got lost in the shuffle of the history, and also in modern history, my field is modern Hebrew literature, so that was my, the center of my attention is the last hundred years of, of writing in Hebrew, not just in literature, but that was the kind of the, the basic, uh, that the sibling story that is so major and this was my first article on the issue, totally skirted the Akedah, the binding. I was afraid of it. I didn't dare jump into it. So I, I dealt more with Isaac and his uh, uh, family, his, uh, uh, his twin uh, uh, sons. And I called it, and Rebecca loved Jacob, but Freud did not. <laughs> and this was, and it's a double pun because, of course, Freud did not deal, it's known, now we know. Uh, and this was also 15 years or 10 years, I don't remember now exactly when, before the famous book on sibling as a psychoanalytic concept came uh, by, what's her name now? Jessica Benjamin. Uh, no, 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 not Jessica Benjamin. Um, no, I, I, I blank now. I blank now. Uh, but if you look up sibling, sex, and power, you'll see uh, it's in, uh, in, within the last uh, 10 years it came out. Um, so, and okay, so I'm coming back today to do a revision or a rewriting or an edition or whatever of my book, which does have Ishmael and Isaac, and I don't deal with Ishmael by itself, that's another story, but the, really the relationship between Israel, Ishmael and Isaac, as they exp are expressed in the, my material, in the Hebrew material, and uh, I want to say what I didn't say in the book, very plainly, that, okay, let me preface this with one sentence. Basically, one of my major arguments in the book is that uh, what happened with the story of the Akedah in modern times in, let's say, the last, the second half of the 20th century is a very strong edipalization. You know, that's why Freud was so important and my coming from psychoanalysis was so important because this is what Israelis have been doing. They were reading, they bought Freud, which I don't buy fully. I mean, if you read, you see I'm always uh, critical, I'm always taking a distance. I'm using him, but with a, with a uh, you know, uh, grain of salt. Uh, and uh, they edipalize totally the story, which totally runs against the, the fiber of the original story. 
I mean, whatever, how we want to, we, we for it or against it, if we are for Abraham or for Isaac, we all talk, of course, in the name of Isaac now. I mean, this is the, the last uh, uh, the stage of the story. But we have to agree that in the original story, the father and son walked together twice repeated, framing the question of Isaac, and th this is the, the, the tenor of the story. So there's no Oedipalization there. And even in the later uh, uh, versions where uh, Isaac becomes the hero and it becomes very early on, this is what leads to Christianity in the end, uh, it, it, it's still, it's not a one against the other. So all this Greek stuff, which Freud is basically, and I do a lot of comparison with the, with the Greek uh, uh, sources on, on this, uh, is of course an Israeli modern recent uh, uh, interpretation that is not because of love of Greece or Greek mythology, it's just influenced or inspired uh, or necessitated by the situation, Hamatzav, as we call it, Hamatzav Israeli, the Israeli, the, 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 the sheer idea of constant war. And here it was my surprise. I thought this was an Israeli invention that the, the, the binding, the Akedah, the, the Isaac all of a sudden dies on the, on, on, uh, in the story rather than being uh, uh, saved and uh, surviving and all the rest of it, is an invention of Israel because of the situation. So there are two surprises. One is the medievalists who actually did it already, uh, Jews, in, uh, in the time of the Crusades. But the more interesting surprise for me was Early, and, and this is a, 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 a book that is not well, very well known to us uh, literary and, and philosophers because it comes from uh, the uh, histo historian of, of religion. Uh, um, um, no, now I, again I have to, to recall. Uh, in a minute I'll tell you. Uh, contesting sacrifice, it's called. Uh, the image of sacrifice, including the Akedah, including Isaac in France in the beginning of the 20th century. In other words, and, and from this book I learned that what we think is our, you know, Israeli, Jewish, or whatever, was all over Europe uh, on the eve of World War I. So the more religious amongst them used the Akedah. The others just talk, uh, talked about sacrifice. But the, the, wherever there was Christian religiosity, this was the, the, uh, uh, the image. For, against, again, I mean, so, uh, and of course, the very uh, well-known uh, poem by uh, the British uh, poet, I'm blanking now Owen. on name, Owen, Owen, Robert Owen, which was written just at the end, just two days, as I call it, even though I'm not sure, maybe two weeks, before he's being, uh, I, I don't want to say death, because he was, you know, uh, killed in the war. Uh, and it was a really premonition uh, poem, which is very much taking almost verbatim the Akedah and, and blaming the old man, the old man and the, and the young, it, it is called, and changing it with the fantastic uh, final lines, uh, 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 adamantly um, blaming the old generation, the fathers, the, the leadership, uh, whatever you want to, to read, however you want to read the metaphor. In other words, uh, all this is to say that Without psychology, we cannot understand it. And I'm not saying psychoanalysis of Freud. I'm saying simply psychology. It's so deep, the metaphor, the story, and the metaphor, that it, and what it stands for, the whole idea of sacrifice, the whole idea of a, the young dying instead of the old. I have a, one of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the writers uh, that is uh, forgotten now because he's not, well, he's not alive anymore in Israel and he's not translated uh, well. Uh, has a fantastic line. Um, the carriers or the inventors of ideas always uh, can, are too old to die for their ideas. And that's it. Uh, that kind, kind of sum, sums up the, 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 the situation. Okay, so all this is true, and this is roughly what comes out, uh, out of my book. And in between, you have the women, you have the, the gender issues, you have uh, Isaac and Ishmael, but I didn't say what I'm saying now, and this is an article in, in, in press, that I think that in Israel, the last 50, 60 years, in other words, from the 60s, preoccupation with that kind, this ver version of the story, the edibilizations of the Akedah, really is a camouflage 
או uh, a way to get away from the real story. Not the real story in the past, the real story in the present, the real political and social story, which is the sibling story. And now, if I have my five minutes, I'm going to, uh, it's uh, the sibling story. I, don't, I know, I'm sure that I, I talked sure. already too much. Jimmy decided to have your sibling story. Go. Okay. So, what do we, I, I, and this is a, th a, a theme that I, I followed in the book, where in every chapter it's kind of chronologically uh, arranged. I decided not to do women and, and men separate, not to do Isaac and Ishmael separate. It's kind of chronological and I do the whole picture. And uh, then when it, it, it came to the very end... second? We should mention, given that comparison, that it's now Eid al -Adha. Yes, thank you. Today. Yes. It's now we, they are finishing, I think it started yesterday. Perhaps? No, four think? days actually. Oh, so I read on yeah. the internet that it's two days. They, they get confused, the okay. internet. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, <laughs> okay, so I'm Last not Last night to Friday. That. But then okay. again, maybe there's more than okay. one version, just okay. like uh, yeah, right, uh, right, right, Rosh Hashanah, right, 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 Passover, right, right. seven oh, days, eight maybe days. Maybe diaspora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Okay. Uh, okay, so. Um, wh when I uh, uh, finished the book, uh, just uh, um, I think it was, uh, yeah, the, uh, the very, mama, really, when I finished the book, Grossman, David Grossman comes out with, with, uh, with his latest big book. I mean, there's another book after that, but uh, if you don't read the Hebrew, you don't know about it yet. Uh, but a, a, a great novel that caused a lot of attention. How many of you know what is called in English to the end of the land? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this kind of, you know, uh, I, I couldn't do more than add a little, you know, paragraph, but I came to it back now uh, and came to the conclusion, and do we have a handout, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone's got it. it. Oh, you have it? Yeah. Okay, can I have a copy? Yeah. <laughs> because my printer wouldn't do. Okay, so this, this, this is my, my uh, 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 thing here. So why am I talking that? I can, I can lead you through this. I mean, okay, so you... The, the first part, the, the major signpost for general Akedan Hebrew culture, it's really a drop from the bucket, leading you from uh, the invention and look at the, the, the line, the long line, the last long line, the concept, and look at the date. That's one of the things that I want you to see, to what extent it has nothing to do with the state of Israel, it has nothing to do with the Holocaust, it's there all the time. Okay? And Osher Akeda, this is, these are the words which I'll translate to you. This is the glory, that's how I, I, I pushed it a little bit, pulled it a little bit. Osher meaning in simple terms happiness, joy, <laughs> uh, bliss. And if you push it a little bit more and you see at what, where it comes from, the happiness of Akeda. I mean, when I discovered it, when my friend discovered it, when I tested everybody around me, have you ever heard of it? What do you think about it? Everybody was in shock. My generation, to talk about Akeda, uh, and the younger generation for sure, uh, 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 is also 1919, this was an invented new concept, translated from Russian, which I discovered no, uh, 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 what it means. When I started to ask around what does it mean in Russian, everybody told me it simply means uh, uh, um, uh, courageous deeds, uh, heroic deeds. I mean, military stuff, when you get a distinction, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the, the Russian word, is it translated by the word Osha Akeda, Podvig it's called. I can't understand why Akeda. Okay, I understand that he was talking about here. You can, you can read it. It's about the volunteers to World War One uh, uh, Army. I mean, uh, why, why, why Akeda? I mean, Akeda and, and militarism. Turns out that, that the word in Russian means something very similar to Akeda. It has a very heavy connotation of, of religion, of, of, of uh, uh, um, uh, div uh, giving yourself uh, um, for a purpose. Uh, really being with Christ, going, uh, becoming Christ in your own life. So I, 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 I was, I understood better, but I was taken aback even more. <coughs> Gerald Katzenelson, the leader of secularist labor Zionism, translate that, cannot find a better way to talk about the, what should they say, uh, uh, enthusiasm, uh, high f uh, eleva elevating, uh, elevation of the idea of volunteering to 
the British army in World War One, then via translating this kind of concept from Russian. By the way, Dostoevsky is full. I didn't know it when I wrote the book. Yeah, yeah, we're not going to yeah. get to okay, your five minutes. Doing, <laughs> okay, okay. So this is this is where we began. No father and son. You see, just a, a very abstract concept. Slowly, you will see how it gets. Uh, you read Moshe Shamir, uh, Izhar. It gets very much into the integrity of sons, fathers blaming themselves, and then sons blaming the father, and so forth and so on. Slowly, though. Uh, number two, I, not slowly, what, one more thing. Ishmael is really very rarely there, but is in a very basic text. Masada, how many of you have heard of Masada? <laughs> the event, the history, but the text I'm sure is not very well known. It's translated, but it's very poorly translated. And it's a long poem in the Russian style, a long, uh, uh, short, but long uh, poem. Uh, about uh, in from the 20s about Israel uh, all of not Israel but the land of Israel the the issue uh, the community being a kind of a masada a last resort okay and uh, lo and behold within this and I won't go into the the whole complicated meaning of of that symbol there is an engagement with that you can read here I I would not I let you read it with with Ishmael and which I call uh, appropriation or reappropriation of the story of Hagar and Ishmael in the desert. He, don't worry about him, worry about us. Now Isaac is under and there's nobody, no, no Hagar, no mother, no angel, no nobody, no God to help him. Um, I asked in the book, is it uh, in response to the appropriation of uh, the Akedah by uh, the uh, Islam, by Quran, maybe, but I, I, I don't know. But you can see already there that this is sibling rivalry at its clearest. And this what is what guided most of the uh, uh, literary rendition of uh, uh, Ishmael and Isaac and in general in a, a, a Israeli culture later on until we come, and this is number three, the bottom of the first page, to the 80s. That's the very first time that I at least found, maybe there were earlier uh, 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 cases, I'm not saying, uh, you know, there's no way to cover everything. Uh, there is an open, openly, uh, Laor is known as, as a, you know, left-wing, crit liberal, critical uh, uh, writer and opinionator and etc. And it's a real uh, 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 call for rebellion. On the part of Isaac, so that he does not end up like Ishmael. So it's an Oedipal and sibling together at the beginning. Now, in five minutes I cannot do it. Fascinating, I, I beg you to read, I don't know if the translation will do it, but if you have not read for a while Chiyuch Agdi, the, the smile of a lamb, you mm -hmm. must. It's really the smile of a kid in, in, in Hebrew and mm -hmm. there's a difference, I analyze that. And again, it's not in the book, it will be later in, in, in my article. Amazing. To what extent this is about the Akedah without ever saying the word Akedah. And as I say here, he, give, he takes, Grossman takes, this is the same Grossman that I started with, uh, he takes the Akedah from the Israeli characters, from the Jewish characters, the male Jewish characters, and gives it to the Palestinian um, protagonist and to the Israeli woman protagonist. And more, uh, we can talk about it. Okay, there's Anton Chamas, I must say a word about him. Uh, and this is, uh, I wrote a big article about it in the past and parts of it is in, in the book. Uh, supposedly, he writes about the uh, Israel and the, uh, and, and the Palestinians, but there's another element there and uh, that was very well hidden in plain sight from a lot of critics who simply didn't want to see it until I pointed it out. Uh, it's a lot about Christian Arabs and Muslim Arabs. I mean, the whole issue starts by his grandfather being killed by the Muslims in the village to which they migrated from the, from the conflict in the north in, in, in Lebanon. So this is another kind of sibling uh, story uh, which uh, uh, we won't uh, go into. And certainly what he argues is a kind of Ish Ish Ishmael's Akedah, their own Akedah, not 
the, the, the usual, not the, from the Quran, but as uh, uh, Arab Christians. I'm skipping, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, and I'm coming to two recent, recently, uh, uh, relatively recent novels, and uh, uh, Grossman, now I know, again, I didn't know it then, now I know, was preceded in a way by Michal Govrin, this is number 12. The novel, Snapshots, absolutely talks about the analogy and trying to merge, unsuccessfully of course, of the Akeda, Isaac Akeda and Ishmael Akeda. I mean, the words are there in, in the text. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, mm -hmm. again, this, is, this will be in, in, in this article in more detail. I'm very, I'm not very, I'm critical about the novel in the sense that I think that its ideology is not really carried out by what happens with the plot and the characters and the relationship, but this ha happens a lot. I mean, it's one way to, one thing to, to have ideas and another thing to be able to translate them into, uh, right, <laughs> into, into, into plots and characters. And the, the, the more a, a, an author is also a philosopher and a thinker and, and a, a person of ideas, the harder it is to get rid of them when you write, uh, when you construct a story. And that brings me to David Grossman. And do we have time to read this paragraph? <laughs> That's the other one. So I, I can't read quickly, so I'll just I'll quote read it for you. you. Okay. Yeah, how about Fine. that? Yeah. She okay. leans back and takes off her glasses and at once feels the strong pulse of the convoy boost through and rise as if from her own body. She turns back to look at the snake of vehicles, the sight of almost festive, exciting, Excited, a huge, colorful parade, lively in its own way. Parents and siblings and girlfriends, even grandparents, fetching their loved ones for the seasonal sale. She thinks a final sale, a young lad in every car. First fruit offering, a spring carnival climaxing in human sacrifice. And how about you? She tells herself off. Look at yourself, how politely and orderly you are bringing here your almost firstborn, the one you love terribly, and Ishmael drives you in a taxi. Okay. <laughs> now, it, she may have taken up a long time, but it's okay because she answered every single one of the questions I had for her for later. <laughs> so it's actually just using time from later now. So don't worry about it. Should I say a few no, words? No, we'll talk about it. You've got to leave me something to ask you. Okay. <laughs> Come on, I worked all this time preparing and you've answered all my questions already. I look stupid. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to say a few words? Um, so, so my take on this topic is, is, is different. It's, it's an obsession with the question of faith. And that suddenly, when I grew up, it was clear, not only that no one had faith, but no one believed in God, certainly not my rabbi, certainly not anyone I knew. I had never met until I was well into my 30s anyone who believed in God, uh, especially rabbis. You didn't get that book? I didn't read that book. But religion has come back, and religion has come back with the thought that faith is a fundamental structure of human experience, and that the thought that faith is a fundamental structure of human experience is very deep in the Christian tradition. It is, in a way, what that tradition is about to a large extent. And the marker of, of faith for Christians is the Isaac story. It is the case. And it's therefore not an accident that, that philosophers, uh, when they think about this at all, turn to what I take to be the most detailed defense of that thought in Kierkegaard. Um, so in what I've been trying to do is trying to think about Kierkegaard. And rather than, as it were, thinking of, of, of what Kierkegaard's doing, um, my thought was to go back and think about the relationship between the secular world and the world of faith. 
And my claim in what I've been thinking about is, is modernity begins, defines itself both in terms of knowledge and in terms of morality through the repudiation of faith. So the two heroes of my story are Descartes, uh, whose uh, first meditation, the worry about the evil demon, the evil demon is just God. What's the first meditation about? It's the relation between faith and reason. And Descartes is staging that debate at the very moment, right, when he was about to publish his great scientific works. Galileo had just been as it were, caught and said you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So the relation between faith and reason was the whole purpose of Descartes' undertaking. And the argument of the cogito is that the very notion of faith is an act of self-repudiation, of self-hatred. You cannot, as it were, because to give the cogito is to say that self-affirmation is the first thought possible by a human being. On my account, the moral beginning of modernity. I got it. <laughs> I think mean, you just touch it a little yeah. bit. Back up, begins in 1603. Uh, and begins with this painting by Caravaggio where Caravaggio had already given a very traditional uh, painting of the Abraham and Isaac story, 1599. Yeah, yeah, show that yeah, first. Yeah. Just have a look. Um, that. Yeah. And this totally traditional, innocent one. There, you know, uh, Isaac patiently, quietly, sweet, pretty boy. This is Caravaggio waiting, the angel, another pretty boy. You know, the knife, the hand is relaxed, the lamb can't wait to be slaughtered. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and, and this is the traditional story. Mm -hmm. What the story is about, I claim, is forgetting about Isaac. In order to read the story of Abraham and Isaac, you've got to think of Abraham as a great moral hero, which is what everything in Kierkegaard is about, mm -hmm. and you have to forget Isaac. And the genius, I think, of Caravaggio, and I, I claim moral modernity begins, I'm going to yeah. date it, right, in February of 1603 when this was painted. Why? Because not only would he let you forget Isaac, but what he does is change the painting from a representation to a presentation, where Isaac addresses you as a witness to his suffering and interprets you as moral witness. So the issue now is about one thing only, his murder. This is what Kierkegaard, in every sentence, is trying to suppress. It's murder. So at the heart of Western religiosity mm -hmm. is murder, is sacrifice. And secularity, if it means anything, must be the absolute repudiation of everything we call religion. That's what Descartes told us. That's what Caravaggio told us. We betray ourselves in thinking there could be a post-secular society. I'll stop there. That's five minutes. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Great. All right. I'll try to keep this brief as well. My argument about um, the binding of Isaac begins as a simple textual argument. It's really a philological uh, take on the story with, um, at least at the beginning, no philosophical, theological, or political ambitions, just the text. Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to rehearse that philological argument here because we don't have the time. Um, 
but the argument basically is that two verses in the story do, do not belong in the text. They are later interpolation into the text. And I think that the textual evidence I have for uh, making this argument are rather um, solid, um, not unproblematic, as all uh, textual interpretation is, but pretty solid. And those are um, the verses that describe exactly what Caravaggio paints there. Namely, um, the moment in which the angel allegedly stops Abraham, and what is allegedly the last moment before he kills his son. And what I try to show is that if you just read the story without those verses, which again, on completely independent philological reasons, you should, uh, I think, take out of the story, you get a very coherent narrative, um, which we can read together now, um, that makes more sense both in, in terms of the text itself and in terms of, of its form, its literary um, style. And um, a very different story emerges. <coughs> then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. But Abraham lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went, and took the ram, and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham disobeys. On his own um, initiative, he decides to sacrifice the ram instead of his son, tachat um, without having received the prior call um, of that angel. A um, couple of questions about this. Um, uh, the Hebrew is there, for those of you who want to check the Hebrew. It makes, I think, more sense um, in Hebrew than in the English. Um, first, the story then is about disobedience, not about obedience, and Abraham establishes the greatest act of faith, is uh, uh, Kierkegaard's night of faith, mm -hmm. uh, exactly in virtue of disobeying God rather than obeying God. Um, Kierkegaard famously says that faith is an absolute relation to the absolute. absolute. Who said that this relation has to be a relation of obedience? Um, if the binding is supposed to present a, the model by which we understand what this absolute relation to the absolute is, then we can also understand now this model as being the model of disobedience. Now we might raise a question, does it make sense that, um, a meta question, so to speak, can, it, um, can we assume that um, um, the Bible, such an old text, would reveal such a modern, um, enlightened picture of man's relation to authority or something of the sort. Um, and of course the answer is um, a plain yes if you just go a few chapters back to the story of Dom and Gomorrah, um, where God um, just tells Abraham about his plan to destroy the city with all its inhabitants, and Abraham comes forth. The text is also on the handout. And so, yeah. Um, Abraham comes near, the Hebrew is vaigash, which Rashi correctly translates or explains as he drew up for battle, vaigash from Nagash. Igash, vaigash Abraham, from Nagash. You know, he, he, he drew up for battle, he came up, he confronted God, basically, and said, will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Far, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slice the righteous with the wicked, so that, so that the righteous should be as wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Well, the question is, are we supposed to assume that the Abraham of the binding is going to sacrifice his son quietly on the altar? Of course, one can make that um, a literary success. One can give reasons why this um, reflection formation between both stories. But one can also see the continuity between um, um, the notion of faith that's being demonstrated in Sodom and Gomorrah and the notion of faith that's de demonstrated um, in the Moriah. Maimonides, who on my interpretation says what I um, say here basically, um, Maimonides writes at some point without clarifying what he means, he says, 
that thing that Abraham said in words, this is interesting for you, what Abraham said in words in Sodom and Gomorrah is what one can understand from his actions um, in the binding of Isaac. He doesn't explain that. Yeah, he has, uh, there are other features in what Maimonides has to say about the story that I think now play well into my hands. I will take two more minutes and I'll mm -hmm. say just um, another point about this. I also see the connection between this story and Dikal and modernity. And I read the evil deceiver, Jay knows this. Um, the God who demands um, Isaac is the God who, the evil deceiver of the first meditation. And the question of man's relation to this God is a question of Abraham and is a question of the cogito. So I said, on my account at least, the Abraham who exactly establishes faith by disobeying God is the same as the meditator who establishes the cogito in relation to the deceiving God in the first meditation. So it's a reading that's um, very relevant. We have something to talk about this here. Um, but it's also very different in its understanding of the relation between modernity and faith. Um, of course, given a different understanding of what faith is. Um, and with that, I start. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, I could, these guys are so polite, I could get these guys fighting brutally in a minute, <laughs> but I, I may not do that so we can get to a conversation. But my, my, only point before I start asking these guys questions is I just think that just in those three introductions you can see Kierkegaard talks about Abraham being either the knight of fate or a madman, right? A holy sacrificer or a murderer. Well, I think with those, this is my book and I have absolutely no background in any of these subjects, not in biblical scholarship, not in philosophy, not in ancient or medieval history. I think you could see what an insane human being I was six or seven years ago to decide to write a book in which I tell a life of the story, essentially from the you book. You must be a fast reader. Yeah. Not, no, I'm a terribly <laughs> slow reader. From the book of Jubilees, essentially, after I imagine the writing of the story. The opening of the story is actually imagining what biblical scholars do all the time, but I do it with more fictional license. I imagine how the story came about, and the the in my telling, the author actually is a ghost writer who was asked by some antho biblical anthology people to help with a, a story of Abraham, the life of Abraham, which they're just stuck on. It just seems to go on and on, and one thing happens after another, but there's no climax. And they go to this ghost writer who's a professional, for love, not money, and he figures out this story that he hands to them. He says he struggles with it and he hands it to them and he says, here, I've got a draft for you. I want to get it, take a few days from it, come back with a fresh set of eyes. It's the story you know is Genesis 22, but he gives it to them, the draft. He go, goes to it with a fresh set of eyes a few days later and thinks, as Professor Bohm does, that he got the story absolutely wrong that Abraham never would have gone off without saying a word. This is the character in every single time from chapter 12 to 22 that God speaks to him. He has a question or a complaint. And here in 22, he's going off without saying a like word. A it, yeah, like a lamb. Absolutely impossible. And of course, the main proof text is, is, is Sodom and Gomorrah, where he challenges God. But you don't need that, because virtually everything he asks God is a question. Every word he says to God is a question. The author, the ghostwriter, realizes this and goes back to his editors and says, i got to revise it. Um, I got Abraham absolutely wrong. It's a great story. I understand what I liked about it a few days ago, but I hate it now. And this is, as Yael said, this book is all about rewriting, revision, subversion. Well, his editors absolutely love it, and they're not going to let him change a word of it. They said, no, you got absolutely Abraham absolutely right. And the story goes on for there. But, yeah, yeah, yes. And um, he is absolutely distraught. He takes comfort only when his wife reads the whole anthology and says, you don't have to worry, this is going to be revised. Because she sees just in the Torah itself that these Jews cannot stop from revising themselves. There's two stories of this and three stories of that and whole books that revise other books. Anyway, I want you to see only that I was absolutely insane. She could have gone on uh, for so long 
long that Ted Cruz would have been impressed with how long she spoke for. Um, just talking about Hebrew versions of the story in the 20th century. I mean, she was just talking about Ishmael and Isaac. These two guys talking about a completely different subject, a completely different way. Source criticism mixed with philosophy and philosophy mixed with art history and the whole history of modernity and secularism and religion. I tried to do the whole thing in 250 pages knowing nothing about anything that I was writing about. So I just, I, I plead guilty to insanity and want to just ask a question. Jay, there's a, a, an essential difference between what you said uh, and what I read in here, which actually explains a ton to me. Because here you speak about, when you're speaking about faith, you speak about both Judaism and Christianity. And you said just cr the Christian tradition when you said it right now. And that, that helps me, because what you're writing about and what I'm writing about is actually, and what he is an example of right here, he is saying, he's saying that the original story itself was not a story of religion starting with murder. It's religion starting with disobedience to God to prevent a murder, so that it does seem to me that most of my book is about the Jewish. I have Christians here. I have Kierkegaard uh, in a very simplistic way, and I have Syriac songwriters from the 5th century who bring Sarah into the story very early on. I have some Luther, and I have the mystery plays. But most of my story, really, even though the Library of Congress marked it under Christianity is a Jewish. Is, yeah, yeah. Look at what you look when you see what they call it. Most of it is a Jewish story. Uh, yeah, I'll probably read it and didn't even notice the Christians in there. But um, but I, I yeah, yeah, you skip. <laughs> but but the Jewish story is one where modernity starts a lot earlier in in your terms. I mean, I utterly buy your critique. But I have a I have a, a liturgical poet in the sixth century Palestine who says that uh, God's daughter, the Torah, refused to marry Abraham because he did not beg for Isaac because in your terms he left Isaac out so it's just a, it's just a small thing but would you agree with my my distinction between the Jewish tradition because the book is all about different versions of it with with, with one proviso okay and the proviso is that much of Jewish uh, spirituality in the West has been shaped by Christianity that uh, the Christian idea of, of so, so Jews didn't need faith, you know, I mean, you know, so, you know, the people of the book, people of rules, all sorts of ways of thinking about Jewish life. Um, Christianity won the argument. Now, that's really my, my response to a lot of your things. That Christianity has shaped both the story, the Moses story, the meaning of monotheism, uh, and above all, I would argue, it's made the Abraham and Isaac story constitutive of the unconditional, you know, the absolute relationship to the absolute. Um, and that this notion of faith is so deep that, and just to press it harder, that one of the stalking horses I have in this piece is I hear over and over again that, that you must choose that the faith reason distinction is absolute. And even, and this is, I've heard friends say this to me, even to believe in reason you have to have faith in reason. <laughs> so that the very idea of faith becomes our idea of what it is to have an affective relationship to something that you think is higher than yourself. As if no one ever heard of love, or to name lots of other relations. Mm -hmm. so, so, part of, so, <laughs> indeed. so part of the animus of what I'm doing is, is I do think uh, that, that the uh, Christianizing of the West um, has had an effect of creating a certain idea of spirituality. Uh, the relationship to God is one of absolute dependence. The relationship is not by reason, but by faith, acknowledgement. And, and that once you have these ideas 
almost as the grammar of human life, then you can understand why, especially in America, where religion is salvic and not cult, right, where the grammar is so deep that the secular cannot even get off the ground, that even the secular is already religious. Mm -hmm. um, and this strikes me as, as, as devastating <laughs> for that reason, right? Because it's a logical sacrifice. Because of, so, so what I'm driven by is how did the West become convinced that our relationship to beloved, to the state, to any ideal is sacrificial? that we've made sacrifice the heart of our, our you know, and just to remind you, just one last thought mm -hmm. there, right? Oliver Wendell Holmes, the beginnings of pragmatism. The beginnings of pragmatism was while Oliver Wendell Holmes thinking about the Civil War and thinking, why have we sacrificed every young man in America to abstract ideals. Sacrifice becomes the model of even our relationship to the ethical. So, so this sacrificial logic seems to me uh, is, is, so this story captures, that's what I want to say, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of the grammar of our, mm -hmm. so I agree that, that the Jewish you know, the great thing about Judaism is mm -hmm. even with God, it was always completely secular, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, there was no afterlife. There was, it was just... Uh, it's not always, though. Not always. Not it right. changed, yeah. right? But yeah. under different impacts. Yeah. Early, early. Right. Yeah. Uh, what I see in the... You no, know, that, 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 that's... That, what I see is that it's a, mat a matter of emphasis. You are looking at the, the thing that's rolling over us. Right. And I struggled in this book to find some <laughs> dissenting traditions. And not necessarily just Jewish uh, religious uh, dissenting, but, but Jewish secular uh, dissenting traditions. But in that, in some ways, I was imagining the ways we could divide this up into a wrestling match. Uh, why I was doing that on the train down, I don't know. But in this case, it's the three of us against you because uh, not not that we disagree with you but just that we're all looking for certain whether looking for it or not finding certain dissenting traditions you are looking for the ball that's rolling over us and the ball that's rolling over us is in all of our work but your work is also full and ends with all sorts of dissents but, 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 but I want to, to go uh, mm -hmm. totally in a different not totally mm -hmm. but obviously not totally but but in a different direction mm -hmm. My, I obviously I, I agree with you, and there's mm -hmm. no question that the, the sacrifice of oneself for one oneself, though, for the rest of us, and then imitation and all that is the heart of Christianity. But, and this is where was one of my beginnings. One is, is the, the, the psychological difference between the Bible, but the other one was I was dying to show that what we have in Judaism today, the, 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 this uh, emphasis I said, is because of Christianity, and it's the fault of Christianity, and I was very disappointed. It's not so. I'm sorry <laughs> to tell you. I'm very sorry to tell you. It took me a long time and a very painful road to come to, to acknowledge two things. And, and you take issue with this, and I understand mm -hmm. that... Uh, um, uh, what's his name, who is now in Barilan uh, from, uh, and, and writes a lot, you cite him a lot, uh, um, about all the interpretation of the Bible. Oh, Kugel. Kugel, Kugel. Kugel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, 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 he, 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 I, I didn't read it, mm -hmm. but I read it in, mm -hmm. in Europe, and I was very happy because I always made fun of the Dead Sea Scrolls mm -hmm. because on one social, one letter, on one letter, they, they create the whole <laughs> theory. Yeah. But I really believe the more I read on the bad Dead Sea Scrolls and all that, that uh, if we call it fault, it's our own fault. <laughs> it's, it's Judaism started that, Absolutely. but Judaism didn't start it. Judaism didn't start it. Oh, no, I don't it's agree, disagree oldest, with you at all about it's that. It's the oldest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. There's no culture that did not have a way, way back then, primitive cultures. For that, you have uh, to read, uh, starting from Fraser, uh, okay. Fraser at the, at the end of the, uh, the, 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 yeah, and ending with the most recent anthology of sacrifice of all the world, China, India. I mean, 
It's all about, you can't get away from it. This is what I'm saying. And if it's so deep, we have to think about it really psychologically. What, what, what does it answer? Uh, deep you, you, human, in deep human psychology that it's so, uh, so necessary, so paramount. For, and the, there's a lot of differences in emphasis and, and all that, the rest we know, but I really think that it's very, very uh, uh, simply a human uh, need that existed and expressed itself in all cultures, and it's very hard to, to, to get rid of them. Secularism and uh, uh, Caravaggio, you know, but I, it, I think does, we doesn't it, matter, it. doesn't it matter to that story? I, I agree with you completely. But isn't what's so shocking about the Abraham and Isaac story is it reverses the direction of sacrificial love. It's always the father who says, I would die for my children that's what it is to have a child, right? Um, and that what's so disturbing about the story is not just that it's sacrificial, but that my claim is to be a parent is to open oneself up to sacrifice. That's the experience of parenthood. And I think universally, I mean, I don't find that this unusual, but if this I story shocks I'm because, saying that, because I say the relationship to the child is relationship to the love of the world. And to sacrifice that, the very idea of having a world at all, whoa. And that's is, why it's religious. And, you and yeah, my, dad, you yeah. just gave the yeah. reason why. Yeah. Because the, the, from the per, not the, my perspective, but the perspective of, of religion is precisely because of this. This is what you have to give up. Absolutely, everything. <laughs> and and what I try to show it, again, just the dissenting traditions is within by the before Jesus, there's Absolutely. Jews that hate it, that hate that idea. That's why they start giving Isaac a voice. They can't stand it. They 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 hate it as much as you do, Jay. Omri, is there hate. a distinction between faith and uh, religion? So, so it's a great question. Um, clearly there is, right? Uh, clearly for one thing we, we traditionally, or traditionally, we certainly distinguish between salvic and cult religions, right? Religion as a way of organizing a social world over time, and religion as a relationship to an absolute for your own redemption. Um, Religion under the first interpretation, which is the dominant structure of religion throughout history, is not about redemption, but about how you organize a social life over time. Right? They didn't have politics. They didn't, right? They, they, religion was the primary original social form. Mm -hmm. uh, a social form, nothing to do with Government. faith. Right? Religion is, and that, that Durkheim got that right mm -hmm. in a way, right? Mm -hmm. When he said, the relationship to God is simply the relationship to your own, own society. You know that there's something, a power that you depend on absolutely. Some people call it God, but Durkheim said, it's just the social itself. It's from which you receive everything that enables you to live. So yes, yeah, so I really distinguish religion okay. and faith. So, I think there was something emerged here between you and Yael when you were talking, when um, we said, look, the first phase was to say against Jay's uh, point, um, maybe this is Christianity's effect on Judaism, something like that. Then we basically reached the conclusion, no, no, <laughs> that's an, more or less a necessary result of human nature or human psychology is a sacrificial logic. Mm -hmm. right? So the question is, what do you Nietzsche need? Is good on that. Yeah. What, the question is, what do you need in order to escape that necessary, by metaphysics, logic, psychology, you name it, um, that necessary outcome? Do you need uh, reason, mm. modernity, or do you need faith? Mm. And how are you going to understand that? Now. I read this story as not so much about sacrifice as about obedience. Of course, both moments are there. But it seems to me that the issue of sacrifice is being raised, in order, at least on a certain reading of the story, in order to test obedience. Mm -hmm. So the issue of the sacrifice of the wall is um, being raised in order to examine whether the believer will obey or not. Right? 
Obey what now? Is it God or Durkheim society? Seems to me that society oh. is what always demands oh, Satan, my obedience. Uh, <laughs> Seems to me that the, the, the overlapping consensus that emerges out of pragmatism, on my reading at least, um, is what demands obedience. Everybody thinks a certain way. There's no way to escape that. Um, we just live in the world. We just live in society. We just have the imminent forms of thinking. Therefore, we cannot escape. Uh, this level of society. And the question is whether you do need a, um, a way of thinking about transcendence, and in that sense, um, um, having some sort of faith, exactly in order to disobey the sacrificial logic and not the other way around. If you'd like, having faith is the only way of not having dogmatic religion. So that faith would be the only way to criticize um, What's going on in our religion? Call it modernity. I know I don't want to use that too um, too simply. Mm -hmm. um, because in my experience, faith is the word to to to, to block any reasoning, any argument. The question is how we uh, how, how you use it. How yeah. we understand that? Yeah. Um, the I think the, I think that's transcendence. I think that I call that painting the moral cogito. Um, and it's the moral cogito because it's the claim that there is something beyond law, beyond con consensus, beyond agreements. There is the demand of the unique value of an individual other human being whose life matters, who calls me to account and to witness. Can I ask a um, Yes. <laughs> Great. Is this a special relation that goes beyond a relation to an idea? That um, for me, ideas are are reflections of human relations, <laughs> and this is beyond that. No, no this you, is the human no, relation. Then the just opposite. You're yeah, the idea human is, is nothing first. more than. No, I mm -hmm. think I think our our moral ideas are. Since I've just written a book on torture, <laughs> I think our, our, our ideas and rules and principles and commands right, are an utter travesty of what we all know to be something better, namely the ways in which we are demanded to respond to human others. Ethics. So, yeah. But ethics for me is just that. The, uh, right. the basic meaning. Yeah. So, so, I think there is transcendence. But I think it's just you. It's <laughs> no, no, right? But that's yeah. still something. I'm, I'm, and I, that doesn't yeah. require faith. Right? That requires, I don't have to have faith in you. I have to acknowledge your full human presence. And, and that for me um, is, is why people use love as a kind of mm -hmm. model of human relationship. And it doesn't matter whether it's the divine. And, that, and, and you can do the divine, and then you can map That's the divine major. onto that, of course. Major. The, God is love. Yeah. Right. And the, loving God. The Christians, though, somehow think that they added love mm -hmm. to right. a loveless relationship between, right. which, is, which is just an interesting, interesting thing. The faith that you so persuasively argue in the first part of your paper <laughs> um, against Habermas and, and others. Um, in my reading of history is something that doesn't come until, Christ until Christianity. The, faith, the word faith and faithful are similar in Greek but it really was, it, the story was about obedience, obedience, whatever was involved in that. And that's an... You mean disobedience? Uh, disobedience or obedience, yeah. Well, that, that's my, my question for you. Know, you go. No, go I ahead. want to ask, yeah. because I know that uh, just mm -hmm. uh, not long ago, I, I, I talked about it, as, like we talk, mm -hmm. as, as if it's obvious that this is about mm -hmm. obedience. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody in the audience uh, was really a minority of... Uh, uh, religious persuasion. I said, where, where do you read the obedience? The story is not about obedience. There's not a word about it in the Bible. And I was kind of, <laughs> <laughs> she's right. It's not about uh, in the Bible. Okay, um, I mean, we can... Uh, when God says, walk in my way, that, that... First of all, God doesn't say walk in my way in the Bible. That's he, Christian. 
Uh, no, no. Well, what does he, in Sodom and Gomorrah he says? This is the man I. This is the man I chose to to oh, oh, show me oh, what oh, is right oh, to oh, walk yeah, in my yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, um, I mean, the, you don't. Of course, you don't need to use the word in order to show. A, no. To the, okay, yeah. but the, the, um, the, as I read the story, I think it has. The, many they call it faith. You see, <laughs> that's the, that's the, but precisely the issue. The, I mean, the angel. Uh, that angel tells Abraham. Because you have done this thing and have not spared your son, your only son, from me, blessing I will bless you. The reading because of the religious that, community is this is about Pure. faith. The, this is the, faith. the Christian community. No, yeah. Jewish community. Jew, oh, the Jewish community only after Christianity. I have no evidence that any of the early ancient exegetes you thought of it as this way. They thought of him as doing what God asked. And that's why you can get into this idea that maybe it wasn't about sacrifice at all. He just chose something really hard for Abraham to do. Jeez, what's the hardest thing? Okay, I, okay. Since so you read it all, when see, does it... When? So, so the reason I... I'm, I'm going to defend Kierkegaard in this... And, and by the way, one of the nicest compliments uh, I ever received was after I gave the, the paper, someone who knew the Kierkegaard very well said, Kierkegaard would not have disagreed with what you said. I, I agree. I, I, yeah, we I, all agree. So, so now yeah. Kierkegaard really means Christianity to be difficult. The reason why I think faith is important and not just obedience is what Kierkegaard requires faith for is that Abraham will get Isaac Absolutely back. right. And that's not just obedience. No, no, I'm saying once, um, once Christianity comes, once Augustine and, and Luther and, come, but, yeah. But, but I'm saying even in human terms, it would be very hard if you think that Abraham does carry it out, right? Not your disobedience story. Then it better be about faith. Yes. Otherwise, it really is pure sacrifice, right? Murder. It's murder, right? Because because then all it is is doing what the authority says. Kierkegaard at least gives it a, what we would call a, a humane content, which I take it is the Christian content that if you give up everything of your worldly attachment, you'll get everything back. Yeah. And, and, and that's important. I have to... And, and why I think the faith reading I don't is... I see, don't see how this counts for anything. Well, because... This is, to, to me, the, the, the problem with Kierkegaard. I, I'm not, I'm no, not saying it's not... Well, but at, at least he thinks the idea of getting back. That's yeah. the absurdity. But just, uh, God will remind you two things. That's the letter to the Hebrews, though. That's the letter that's to the Hebrews. That's the story Hebrews. of Job. Once you understood yes, the, one, yeah. the connection between yeah. the binding and Job, you remember that everything that uh, was taken from Job was returned. Was returned. Right. 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 Huh? Not you the life of those who die. Of course not. But you received <laughs> more, more sons and more money. Right. Um, got the border. There's a gentleman here who wants to ask. Yes, I do have that. Yeah. Uh, I would like just to make two remarks. Sure. First of all, Abraham never got back Yitzhak. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He never, after the Akedah, mm -hmm. he never met him again. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most beautiful parts of the Akedah, in the beginning, the angel says, Kach et bincha it yichat it yichitcha asha hafta. After the Akedah, the angel says, Kach et bincha et yichitcha. Mm -hmm. the, the text says, a father that is ready to kill his son, there's no more love. And the word ahafta mm -hmm. does not appear yeah. in the text. Isn't it? In it, the, it appears at the beginning, the beginning so he says the one you love, no, but he doesn't say no, love at the second time. No, you're right. absolutely right. That is, that is right. Yeah. yeah. So yes. in the first in, in the first sentence, when he commands him, yeah, he, love he, yes, you know, you're right. Yeah. And after that, yes. the yeah. angel says, uh -huh. yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely right. It's so sharp here. Yeah. The rabbis the, the love that. The text itself yeah. shows yeah. that, and interesting enough, that um, the only time that Yitzhak and Abraham meet when Abraham dies, mm -hmm. and he comes with Ishmael, to bury him. Where, does, where does he find him? Beit el Re'i, where Hagar, Yitzhak, after the Akedah, goes to Hagar. She is his mother. Right. And there's a certain love between 
Yishmael and Yitzchak, which is fascinating in the text, mm-hmm. and nobody pays attention to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Some did, some did. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. some. There's, there's, there's a rabbi, a Colorado rabbi, who actually ima- reimagines it to bring Sarah in. He read it well. Sarah, Sarah um, imagines, uh, Sarah thinks Abraham is going crazy long before this. Circumcision at 99, <laughs> among other things, and she takes off. So the ex- what we think of as the expulsion of Hagar is just just a plan to get away from this is another, a, another plan. So they make idea. this idea that, that she's going to tell Abraham to get rid of Hagar. Actually, Hagar goes to the desert, and then Sarah goes and it's lives with her. She couldn't prevent the binding of Isaac because Abraham is still his father, but they go back, just as you're saying, yeah. afterwards, yeah. and they're healed by by their mothers, but never never speak to their father again until they together bury him. Well, Abraham and Isaac yeah. never speak yeah. anyway. Yeah. 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 I wanted yeah. to mention something yeah. also because we have Caravaggio here. So mm-hmm. Jay is using Caravaggio as um, a philosopher, basically as an interpreter of the story. Um, a strong interpreter of the story, I think. Yes. And I wanted to point out about... Um, no, of course, but I wanted to point out that there's a way in which the story demands it in a way that's um, not obvious, but interesting to, um, to notice. The story begins with a sentence, God tested, uh, tested Abraham. Of course, the translation tested is a very problematic um, um, translation because the verb nisa, which get, gets interpreted as tested, can also be interpreted as it was interpreted by Maimonides, as a presented, yeah. as a model. Now that's yes. a very problematic interpretation, My even though, said yeah. 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 but it also it goes from off from Nes. Yeah, yes. exactly yeah. Nes. So, um, and, but uh, it's uh, grammatically it's, incorrect. Uh, I think it's philosophically very consistent, actually, but I, I, I have no, no but, is one thing. But uh, but Omri, it goes all the way back to the Book of Jubilees, though. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean. There, it goes mm-hmm. back to the it goes back to the, the to the text of the of the oh, of Genesis itself, mm-hmm. because um, the word is very appropriate there, because the um, how, do say, milam, how do you say milam and how do you say milam and the key word the leading <laughs> the leading word the, in this story, which is um, in an obsessive way appearing in this story. It's just not just a key word that appears a couple of times. Is a word si. si. Abraham is not called God-fearing, but God-seeing man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Moriah, the mountain, has so the eye really inside it. Field. Abraham the lifts up. Is a, yeah, there's a whole... Yeah. It's a visual field. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all the field is visual, and you know where, you, you know where um, it comes up in the, last, um, in the last and most beautiful moment, when Isaac goes blind. Mm-hmm. So um, all, that ev- all those events so on the mountain, yeah. Isaac eventually is blind in his old age. So there's a real argument in that from within the story to take a painting Mm-hmm. To be the way to do um, oh, wow. that's justice. Nice. That's, nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. that's very nice. That's Thank something you. to think about. It's all coming out of this world. He prese- After those things, God presented Abraham. <laughs> he manifested it. The blindness of, Ar- of, the, of Yitzhak, because the angels were crying. Mm-hmm. Right. The tears fell into his eyes. Yeah, the, uh, Abraham's uh, eye, tears yeah. mixed yeah. with or, the angels' or tears. The, the brightness tears. of the blade also. Yeah. Other people. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a <laughs> Just a question of how to exit the, the logic of sacrifice. I think of the essay by Etienne Lavoie's See on Voluntary Servitude. Yeah. And he's, he argues that in order to stop being voluntarily a slave, you don't have to do anything. You just have to stop doing something. Yeah. Namely, you're submitting yourself voluntarily to the, the, the one. It's not, you have to do anything. You just have to stop. Stop doing something. Okay. I, That's I, interesting. Can I, in, 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 mm-hmm. There's something that I wanted to say before to Omri, what you were talking, or all of us are talking about. Uh, uh, okay, if we agree, acknowledge that this is like a deep, like I said before, a deep human thing, and so how do we get out of it? By asking how, we really ignore this very long tradition that's interpreted the story precisely as a story about getting out of it. I mean, this is the number one understanding it is. of the story. W- whether it's in the text or not, it's another issue. But that's the, the basic reading of it, that this is about uh, not doing it. And my, the issue for me was, if this is how we were raised, like with thousands of years of understanding it, how come, come 20th century, 
we are all about reading it as sacrificing. And then I found out that it goes all the way back, mm -hmm. at least maybe even, and, and, and actually earlier, yeah. because in uh, Yosifus, Yosif oh, yeah. he, he runs, and this is a little correction to what you said, mm -hmm. it's true that in the turn of the Christian era, mm -hmm. Everybody shift, or not everybody, but most shift so, to Isaac to uh -huh. becoming the hero. But he's not a, a critique. Oh, Just no. the opposite. No, no. He is the one so oh, no, no. himself. It's a martyrdom. That's no. why I say the story is revised, yeah. but not how the author would have liked. Okay. They make right, it even right, worse. Right, not right, time. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, a few things about um, the painting and uh, about sacrifice. I would like just to say that in English, sacrifice is very sacred. In Hebrew, you have korban, a ola, mincha. There are all words that originally were, have, don't have specifically anything to do with uh, sacred, sacredness. Mm, so, so, but they have to do in practice, not in not semantically, well, but in practice. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, the notion of, uh, of sacredness probably came later and influenced Judaism uh, to this kind of kadosh. Uh, which is uh, the the Shah in Hebrew, which is not usually is not related uh, to the to the story of uh, the Akedah. That's but, all. It happens in after the Crusades. The same. Uh, the same it, turning another point. Another thing about the painting uh, of Caravaggio is um, and the tradition of Rembrandt and, and that general uh, that era. The angel usually touches Abra. Uh, Uber said that. Um, God of the Hebrews, the, the biblical God is really an audible God. Right. He mostly speaks. It's and this, in a way, is really a, a psychological story. <laughs> Abraham hears voices. Here we are talks about. He hears voices, and Sart asks, "How did he know that uh, mm -hmm. he heard the voice of God and not, not the, the voice Satan. of, uh, <laughs> right. of, uh, of Satan?" Satan. <laughs> uh, that was his anguish, and so uh, so that's another thing: is that everything is a mind is a mind game in a way. And about the test, uh, I would like to uh, yep. point out, when it, when it opens, the story says, and he tested Abraham. But what did he test him? Is it really about obedience? He tested him about something. <laughs> but it's not necessarily, you have to, if you read just the lines, just the words, we don't know um, what is the test. I mean, the test could be many things. Maybe I might be the, the only one who actually reads this as presented him as a model rather than yeah. tested him at all. Okay. I don't. I, I really don't I think. I wasn't aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the word. Um, um, no, no. In the midrash, there, there is uh, certainly. Oh, no raise, him, raise him up yeah, like yeah, a banner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. today people are actually are taking oh, this oh. as actually yeah. the meaning of what's going on. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's Not true. It's certainly one day. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, the difference between seeing and hearing and. Um, that's actually very important in the interpretation of the story, and um, at least the, um, the, the way in which the Aristotelian interpreters of the story, actually. There's a whole prophetology going on there. So what's the distinction between um, uh, hearing God, seeing an angel, those are different levels of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And it's but a very he interesting fact. He only hears. Everything is here. He, he hearing. sees the angel. No, the angel calls him from the, from the sky, but, but he doesn't say that he sees it. Um, there is no, at least I don't remember. Maybe, maybe there is. No, he, he doesn't. The, the verb seeing doesn't come in there. Well, he's, the, word, the word seeing does not appear, but um, the he angel calls an Abraham. Angel, but, yeah. He calls Abraham from the heavens. Yes. Right. And the it's way right. in which this is interpreted, it's by cross, so that's hearing. But it it's, gets interpreted as. Um, this is your interpretation. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my interpretation, it's but, Maimonides. Okay. Uh, which. It doesn't make it true, but uh, makes it more uh, canonical. But, um, um, this is because it's coming from the heaven. This is why he thinks it's the same. Yeah. Why? Um, sorry. Because if it's up, he sees what? Well, why? Yes, because, because Abraham had to lift up. Abraham ah, lifted lift up his eyes. eyes right? Yeah, right. So the eyes are. That's the ram. Yeah. That's no, 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 what he's saying. No, no, no. up is for the ram, right? Yeah. It's, not for the ram. it's because up, up always has to do with the head. Right. No, no, yeah, the, I understand the, that, but it's, it's, not, in that, it's not in that context. It's in the context of the realm. realm. The realm. <laughs> it's the realm, um, yeah. You're, you're, I, think you're, I think you're right about the text, um, about the specifics but of the, the text. But the interpretation is another thing. There is, um, there is a reason why Maimonides picks up on that, and he says when Abraham, um, the highest degree of prophecy is seeing an angel rather than hearing God, as Abraham in the case of the binding. And um, there's a reason why 
we, we need to ask why Maimonides um, mm -hmm. makes that interpretation. I, I think why. Jay um, <laughs> has a point there when he says um, that in order to see something from the heaven, that, have, that has to be seen. You don't see, you don't hear something from the heaven. You see it from the heaven. That's Maimonides' point at least. In any case, that, that's, a, that's a key, I think, to the installation of the story, um, those distinctions. I just want to point out that the issue of the psychology, or the, if you are a secular, I am secular, <laughs> and, it's, uh, and, you, and you read it, you can read it without the rem, you can read it without, without God and, and without, and yes. without yeah. an angel. Absolutely. You can read yes. it as a psychological story. Yes, uh, of course. Oh, Absolutely. A, a, yeah. yeah. Good. Right here. Yeah. Um, okay, my quest questions may mainly go to uh, to Jay and um, uh, just like the last time I was at a, a talk with uh, y'all um, uh, I loved the, the start of where you were going and I was and, and I'm, I'm thrilled that one of the things that you seem to be doing um, without state stating it is trying to rethink the modern concept of culture the modern concept of cul 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 culture was invented to exclude faith, right? And that uh, the modern concept of culture was supposed to point us towards those things which were intrinsically and universe universally val valuable. Um, uh, and because faith had become pri pri privatized, um, could not serve in that same but I think Kierkegaard is doing something very dif different from what you're saying. I mean, you made the suggest suggestion that he forgets about Isaac to laud a Abraham as his claim of faith. I don't think that's what's going on in the text, <laughs> right? Um, for a few reasons. The first one is he says that he does not understand Abraham. The whole point of the text itself is because he doesn't understand Abraham. He wants to understand him. That's true. But the whole problem is that there's this incommunicable incommun uh, aspect of faith, right? That um, how is it that Abraham ought to do this deed, but yet that ought can't be understood by others? In other words, we could say the whole of fear and trembling is about the problem of just justification of our actions, and I think in this in this respect, um, uh, the issue of culture returns because justification before others cannot take the form of faith in the modern world, or at least according to the Enlightenment concept of culture, right? Uh, so that's just a few com, com, comments there. My question, my, my essential question, question to you is on this logic of sac, sacrifice, which I think is intim, intimately tied with the way in which the Enlightenment concept of cold, cold culture works. Um, but that would need to still be some that. I think you're conflate, conflating two things. One, the, sac the sacrifice of others mm. and or the self, on the one hand, and the, sac the sacrifice of faith, on the other. Has, if modern modern modernity sac sacrifices faith, that doesn't mean that it sac sacrifices others. Um, and I just think that those two need to be mm -hmm. distinct, dis distinguishable. So, so one of the things that's remarkable, I think, about um, Kierkegaard is that he perfectly understood Descartes. He understood that the cogito was meant to be an absolute repudiation of the idea of faith, which is why he makes faith a matter of paradox, the absurd, of silence, of indirect communication. That is, he has to put out of play. Right? So the idea of the intelligibility of faith 
is of course outside of faith it is absolutely unintelligible and that's why Kierkegaard is so tough right he demands that the only way to comprehend faith is from within faith right and that furthermore once you have faith you know you're the, the night of faith is just like you and me you wouldn't know it for a second right? so so I don't know if we disagree. I just take that to be upping the upping, upping the ante in a way that's necessary, given the logic. The second thing I think I want to say is, um, I think we've been agreeing that the logic of sacrifice um, is 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 deeper or more pervasive than the logic of faith. Faith is a certain version of it at a certain time within Western spirituality. The logic of sacrifice is deeper. Given my philosophical views, right, I think it's about the bad relationship between the individual and the universal. Right? That, that the universal is what's true and the individual has to be brought under the universal. And therefore, I consider enlightenment a sacrificial logic. Right? Right. And my great, you know, for me, the, the evil genius of modernity is, is, is common. Right? And reflect, but Kant's reflective judgment would be the way to escape that? Yes, it would. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. so, so I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I, 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 I don't want to give, uh, I think it's so important to give faith no space whatsoever. <laughs> We have so many good words for trust, for love, for commitment. We can do without the word desire. Faith. I desire. Mean, we desire. have a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Right. We have a lot of stuff. We can try to get rid of the syntax of this language, and we should. We should not feel that. I think we should let that word go elsewhere. Isolate. No, no. I, I see that. And just really quick. But in doing that, you give up one form of just, just to think I'm okay with giving up this. Just, just, just. I think we have to. <laughs> but it, as part of it, the human experience. Well, I'm, I'm just going to go. No, no, I'm just going to go back to that. Our only justification is justification before the other. Do you want to read, read this for us, Jane? Yeah. Ah. The epigraph. Right Salman yeah. Rushdie. Yeah. It's an end issue. <laughs> New images urgently need to be made, images for a godless world, until the language of irreligion caught up with the holy stuff, these sainted echoes would never fade, would retain their problematic power, even over her. I agree with Salomon. <laughs> we need to invent new concepts. Absolutely. New concepts. images, new concepts. Mm -hmm. New ideas of human connectedness, new ideas of authority. That's actually... That's what Kierkegaard talks about is that you can't really treat up faith in a, um, in a kind of a prosaic way. It's such a, it, it's something it's that is, is at some, is at some point he says, going through faith is like a, it's a person by person, like a, going at a straight to Thermopylae. It's like one at a time. So you can't, you don't go, you don't get in the mess. This is religion. But, 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 I mean, everybody so, uses it as a... No, 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 but I think, so I think what makes oh, yeah. Chief so, Guard uh, so dangerous is what he does is create an image of Abraham as having sublime virtue. That is, the way his indirect communication works is to try to show that God asked this impossible thing. And his image of Abraham is someone who does not justify, but rather through silence. He doesn't talk to his wife. He doesn't talk to anyone else. He, and, and this is beyond tragic heroism. Right? This is beyond the Greeks. This is an idea ideal. of nobility. It's an ideal. It's an ideal. And, and, and what is this idea? It's an aesthetic ideal. Mm -hmm. So what, um, and this is what makes 
it's right here, but it's not an example, so it's okay. No, no, well. <laughs> 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 but you're, you're I, I, I never know. I never know reading it, and I don't read German. Um, my, my, my Danish, Danish, German, the whole thing. Um, I never know if he if he admires him or thinks he's a madman. That's the. I think that he sets up that ideal. I absolutely agree with you, Jay. That he sets up that ideal and he just makes it as intense and as elevated as can possibly be. And yet the book is written from a pseudonym. And I do not know if Kierkegaard thinks he's a, a madman. Right? It seems to me that the danger is not. Kierkegaard might be sophisticated enough in order to know the difference. Yeah. Between actually looking yeah. at his yeah. Abraham yeah. and yeah. Um, sticking yeah. to that fine point where you don't know whether you decide or not, mm -hmm. um, but his readers, of course, are. Yeah, and that, exactly. That's that's that. Exactly. And, I, and I agree. It's, it's, but but I, want, I actually wanted to tackle a different point I mean, uh, that Jay made, yeah. Yeah. and the, the notion was a notion of the new concepts that need to be uh, created. I take it the emphasis is on new, right? Absolutely. Because they're new we can um, uh, break the logic of sacrifice because the individual doesn't have to be sacrificed to the universe. Yes. And that n creation of new concepts is this modernity, sorry, this culture of modernity, which is supposed to replace faith. Right? So this is the way in which fa um, modernity, cultural modernity would replace religion in its sacrificial logic. Yeah, okay. But here's where I'm... Um, not completely certain that that would be um, a modern cultural yes. position rather than exactly, once again, a religious uh, perspective. Because, of course, the notion of the new is the religious concept par excellence. It's not a religious, it's not an, 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 the new is not new. The new is very old. It is about the creation of the world. The basic concept of religion, you have exactly to um, accept that new yet meaningful creation of a new order, and this is what faith means, believing in creation ex nihilo. Um, again, I'm with my monedas all the time here. Um, <laughs> prophecy is not the telling of the future, but the creation of the new yet meaningful. Very much that notion that I take you um, are um, identifying as the cultural modernity that's supposed to replace faith. But only that it's fake, and it's all. <laughs> so I don't see, I don't see the necessity of the language of faith. Hmm. I see the necessity of acknowledging human risk, of uncertainty, of acknowledgement of our powerlessness before a future we cannot control or predict. And I take, I mean, I take religion. To, so for me, the deepest structure of religion was for the sake of acknowledging the limits of human power. That religion was a complicated uh, creation of trying to think about what it meant that we could not control our own lives or what would happen or the like. And hence, acknowledging use of, of faith was I am powerless, but right, there is a power. Right? I take it that that moving away from that thought, that is moving away from faith, is an acknowledgement of that fragility, of the inevitability of human loss, and of our responsibility for it. And again, I see no necessity how about spirituality? Um, it depends what you mean by spirituality. It almost like, seems... More dangerous than faith. In I, I, but it almost faith. seems like... And I want to get, let other but people jump in. It but it almost faith. seems like the word itself, it, you feel, is too dangerous and too freighted with history for us to touch it. And so if I were to interview just the two of you for a few hours, in fact, it's no. that word. The word itself. It's not all sorts of things. Anyway, more people. Yeah. Well, you made Yael the sacrificial lamb, you send it first. <laughs> uh, however, I'm very surprised that after Yael, no one spoke about the crucifixion and Jesus, which is 
Well, but this in is... Akeda, it's real Akeda. Which... Mm -hmm. We could we could have a whole uh, seminar, two hours, on the relationship between the two stories. This is what was obvious when we said that sacrifice became the, the, the I, marker any, of Christianity. Anyone right. has any comments about the similarities between... It's not similarities, it's, 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 it's a revision. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rewriting. <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I take it, I mean, I think we all here take it, but that is the rewriting, right? right? right. That that whatever interpretations of the story were floating around and in debate, once that story took hold, then that drove out all the disobedient stories, all the other stories, and became the model, mm -hmm. right? Look, here's a way to think about it. So I, the, I, I agree. The reason why the, what we in Hebrew call akedat Yitzchak is called the often sacrifice. the sacrifice of Isaac, is exactly that um, mm -hmm. the story. It's in the name, right? Because Jesus is sacrificed, unlike Isaac. Akedah so, is sacrifice 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 is sacrificed No, Akedah, Akedah is it's a binding. binding. Whereas, but, but Jesus is sacrificed, mm -hmm. so it's in this reflective moment, movement that people also go back to the binding of Isaac and call it the sacrifice of Isaac. Of Isaac. You have on the handout, in my handout, under four, you will have... Um, so you really need to see. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, which gives that picture very clear. Mm -hmm. And you have rabbis and priests in the, in the third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth vying for the best sacrifice story. Yeah. Maybe, so, maybe another interesting comment. I, will yeah. not, I, can, yeah. I can't really um, say much about this now, but Kant is probably the first philosopher, uh, uh, Jay's favorite philosopher. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, right? Um, <laughs> is probably the first philosopher in Western culture who says Abraham ought to have disobeyed. Mm, yeah. um, so, you know, people sometimes accuse Kant of being a philosopher of obedience. It's interesting to see that he's actually, in, you know, relating to that story. Um, saying, and in the very beginning but, of his book said, not even to listen to Jesus should he appear exactly. for you. And, the, and the, that's the, how he begins the groundwork. Okay, so this is and the but, result he, of, uh, but, but I just want to yeah. say this, and he's very explicitly saying that he's deconstructing this story in order to go against the crucifixion. So Kant saying in religion uh, within the boundaries of prison mm -hmm. alone, for example, that Abraham ought to have disobeyed, very consciously and explicitly saying the story of the crucifixion that's a bad form of religion, bad Christianity. Um, but, but, but the first, that, that has to be qualified, the first philosopher, the first philosopher yeah, to yeah. say that, because yes, rabbis yeah, said it. Yeah. And um, uh, liturgical yeah. poets said that Abraham should have disobeyed. But Omri, Ibn Kaspi, I think, says that Abraham was disobeying. That it was the higher that that the educated yeah, that, reader understood that he was disobeying, that he knew that God wanted him to disobey. So that's the only thing about Kant being the first. Oh, I meant you know, no, um, okay. even Caspi writes when in the thirteenth century. Thirteenth century. I see the first. I meant uh, Kant, um, Kant is yeah. I see. We know philosophers who are doing that. Yeah. We we that but that tradition no, is forgotten. Yeah, it that's is. exactly. It is totally uh, it's, uh, hidden. Then, yeah. I, until got I read it, I had no idea about it. Got it's it. not something that is alive at mm -hmm. all. Yeah, was mm -hmm. very well hidden by the rabbis. Uh, I mean. mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes. No, no, that's. Uh... Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You two, either one or I mean, one. Yeah. This is an aside. I mean, just before going to Ireland, I read a history of Ireland, and a remarkable thing that Saint Patrick converts. Irish, and his, his argument was that because the Irish religion, the native religion, was so bestial, so it required so much human sacrifice, when somebody could say, hey, it's already done, Christianity sees itself as uh, 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 canceling sacrifices sacrifice. uh, uh, in the temple. I mean, uh, this is the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. absolutely. This is uh, really the, the two edge. Uh, but of course, when it reemerges so then with politics, for example, in Israel, then that sacrifice uh, comes back at the back do in the back door. Yeah. <clears throat> I almost want to say or ask too much, so I uh, try to hope this is uh, cogent. I guess the, the crux of things, I'm thinking about sacrifice and faith, whether faith is something that we should 
reject entirely, or whether it seems, I would say, Almeida seems to me like you want to, you want to reclaim it or reinterpret it. Um, I don't know if that's right. But I was thinking about faith and what, it, what, what faith means here, particularly tied together with the notion of sacrifice. And as the thought for me that, that faith has to do with, it's always sort of precisely the faith that things will work out. Right, the, the, the faith that um, w what has been done will, will work out even if it doesn't seem like mm -hmm. it or what have you. So that the faith in the sacrifice is the faith that the sacrifice will be worth it. So I guess my question is, it seems to me on the one hand, if we get rid of that, well then, that would mean the sacrifice isn't worth it. So it would be a kind of irredeemable loss or something. And that seems morally powerful because it would make you have no way to justify sacrificing a human being or what have you. But then what I'm worried about on the other hand is whether in some other instances the notion of faith is something that we sort of need uh, to be able to do anything, to say, you know, to engage in political activity or even to uh, fall in love or something like that, right? So I mean, can Descartes, if he's really serious, do anything except sit in a dark room? Mm -hmm. You want to come in on that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I just want to say that I actually don't think you can talk about faith from a consequentialist perspective. And I think that's sort of what's been going on here a little bit. Is you know, faith is the belief that everything will work out. But I don't think that is what faith is in the Christian tradition at all. Um, mm -hmm. Fides is Latin, you know, it's truthfulness. It's being true to, to something, right? Um, and the same with pistis. There's, you know, that's, that's Paul Saul of Tarsus' term, right? It's an absolute belief. And it's a belief against all evidence to the contrary. Exactly, against right? all. And that's that's yeah. what makes it faith rather than right. expectation or being confidence or trust. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, not to do it. But yeah. in, 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 God no matter what God evidence for, for once presented, it, still believing uh, you know, in, in that uh, in which one has faith. So I, I actually don't think that you know, Abraham, it, it doesn't make sense from a Christian perspective to interpret the story as Abraham thinking that um, it's all going to work out in the end. It doesn't matter what he thinks, right? If, he's, if it's an act of faith, it doesn't matter what his expectations are. But that's, that's, that, but that's so God. interesting. That's the Jewish. See, I would say that's the Jewish no, way. The but, but, but the letter to the Hebrews and Augustine and Luther and Kierkegaard all say flat out that Abraham, the, the, the absurdity of it, Kierkegaard says, is that he's going to sacrifice him and have him too. And he's going to break off his engagement to uh, uh, Rene Olson, uh, Regine Olson, and have her back. So I mean, each of them say that is that is such an yeah, important more than in, one. in letter to the Hebrews. Yeah. That is Christianity such a twist on the Jewish understanding because my understanding and everything I've read from whenever the story was written to the time of letters to the Hebrew is that there's no evidence that anyone thought that Abraham knew what was going to happen after he went up there. So that's why I, I, I think of it as Christian. I understand what you're saying about faith in a much larger Christian sense, aside from this story. I completely understand what you're saying. Uh, I think that what, what makes uh, the story uh, attractive to Kierkegaard, in a way, is because faith is a solitary thing, it's, uh, as opposed to religion, which is a mm -hmm. social. Mm -hmm. And Abraham, unlike Agamemnon, um, walks for three days, he's doing everything by himself. I mean, he makes his own decision, he doesn't share, he can't share. The minute he shares, it becomes social, it becomes a murder. But if he does it alone, it's a faith. I mean, okay, it's a madman mm -hmm. also. I mean, when society looks at it, it becomes a <laughs> madness. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm reacting to something that just hit me now. Uh, being the non-philosophy uh, philosopher amongst you, no, uh, the two of us. Okay, <laughs> I, I, it, it shocked me just now thinking. Why did I let you talk so much about secularism or, 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 or whatever <laughs> you want to call it as getting rid of sacrifice? 
my whole book, my own, all our three books are about the sacrifice of the secular modern state, basically. Uh, if you put the sacrifice and national experience, and the and the national Israeli experience. national experience. Yeah. Yeah. So where is where what happened to the, the to the protest? <laughs> Four hundred years, <laughs> and we are in the same place. Have no you guys, escape. Have no you escape. guys read Moshe Halbertal's book? Not yet. <laughs> on yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. That's interesting. I know. I mean, it's to, on my list. Yeah, it's on, to, to, <laughs> to think about. Well, I won't get into it now, but it's, it, he tries to help answer your question. Maybe the modern state is not secular. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, I, I, secular not, not quotation. Yeah. I put yeah. in quotation marks, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, but, but, but no, I mean, yeah. there is a, um, I'm also having a name problem. <laughs> <laughs> Political philosopher, legal theorist at Yale, has written a couple of books in which he defends torture oh. and defends torture strictly on the basis of the thought that if you are to have a relationship to a state at all, then there must be a notion of sacrifice. And if you're willing to sacrifice yourself and die for the good of your state, why on earth wouldn't you be willing to sacrifice some guy? That's exactly that my thought. That's exactly. I mean, so, so, That's exactly. So, that the, uh, so no, I perfectly yeah. agree that yeah. the logic, uh, a certain logic of the modern state, is a sacrificial logic. That's what I meant by bringing up Oliver Wendell Holmes, because mm -hmm. that's the way he understood the Civil War, right? As as everyone being sent to slaughter for okay. Abstract. So this is the point to send you to read the novel, considered the first American novel, I'm now going beyond my mm -hmm. expertise, which I'm sure nobody ever uh, read here, and it's called Villain. Anybody heard about it? Read it? No. Small pocketbook came out uh, when I was uh, uh, at the beginning of my career here in, in, in the States. And my American uh, uh, students who were studying American literature came to me, and I was teaching Bible of all things, and said, so you must read this book. And it was, uh, I didn't have time, of course, it was on my shelf, until uh, 10 years later, a, a student did a paper on this book. In relation, and all of a sudden, I discovered it's about the Akedah, it's about the, about, the, about the Binding of Isaac. And it's based on a true story, it happened in America, and it's from 1787, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere like this, a, 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 a end of the 18th century, that early. And the sense, the, uh, 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 the major character, he voices that he uh, 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 interprets as God's voices to telling him to burn his Bible and kill his whole family. That's all. And uh, the, the, the sheer uh, uh, um, interpretation of uh, hearing voices, God, command, with the sense of uh, 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 what, what we call it, the pangs mm -hmm. of nationhood. Uh, the beginning of uh, 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 the, the states, uh, and, and amazing, mind-boggling, and uh, this is uh, this, this is this is to the to the. But, I mean, a classic uh, 18th century Scottish novel by James Hogg, Confessions of yeah. a Justified Sinner, yeah. uh, is the same story, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's and it's you know. Uh, talk about hearing. That's what yeah. it is about. Really, I don't know this. Oh, yeah. James Hogg. It's it's a. Great English, I mean, mm -hmm. Scottish novel. Scottish. And about uh, predestination. And predestination, right? This is the Calvinist version yeah. of it all. He's mm -hmm. asking, what is Calvinism? Mm -hmm. It's hearing voices and killing people. No, but is, no, <laughs> but, but, but is it connected to nationhood? That's my question. This is the point here. It's the Calvinism beginning. Calvinism is connected to Scottish nationhood. I see, sure. I see. Okay, <laughs> okay. So it's the same idea? It's the same idea. Yeah. Anyone else? Just a question. Yes, go. <laughs> go. We have a couple more minutes, according to the program. There would be some justification. And so the faith is a, it's whatever we're talking about, the faith is that there will be, that it will be justified. What we be seen as a part of what. Yeah, I want to make it clear that I think that you're right about Christianity. It, when I was growing up, and even though I was Jewish and they tried to keep me away, I met some Christians uh, when I was young. <laughs> that, uh, that 
what you said, as opposed to the way it's been narrowly talked about in this story, was right. That they that they said their a child died or something, and it would they were not going to get that child back. You know, so I mean, I think you make an important distinction between what goes on in the story, which, as important as we all think it is, is one story, and there's more to Christianity. I guess I just mean if you want to reinterpret the story in a non-Christian way, not as a, an act of Christian faith, then you have to really, you know, at least give Christian faith its full, you know. Sure, but, but at the same time, so here's, here's, here's the logical puzzle on that. Um, the flip view is, is the reason we need God is to accept absolute loss, uh, which is what your claim is. Um, and I guess I want to know what it means to accept absolute loss as requiring a belief in a higher power. In other words, I take the acceptance of absolute loss, mourning, right, as, as what it means to be an adult. Um, and, and I take it that religion was one way of working through that. Mm -hmm. I perfectly think that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, my question is, in what sense um, is religion in that respect not a petitia, right? not a begging of the question? Because if you, you, if you require an absolute power in order to accept irredeemable laws, then I want to know why. In other words, I take it there might be so, so the getting back is, you're right, too strong, right? But there has to be some sense of, as Christians always say, it's God's will. Mm -hmm. There's a right to it. Jews always say it's God's will. They don't mean it in the same way. They don't mean it. You don't mean it, but they don't. But people they, who mean God's will, there's, right, right. there's a rightness <laughs> to it. So, so although it's not <laughs> Why does he get getting say? Isaac back, <laughs> because I think the thought that it will work out, it has meaning, it is not for nothing, <laughs> is part of what is part of the logic of that. And that's not a logic of, but I agree, it's not an instrumental yes, calculus, right. but it is an understanding oh, of, oh, of loss as less than so completely on. absolute. That's you wanted to ask the last question? Yeah, the comparison between um, Israeli parents sending children to die to the Akidah. Uh, in the Akidah, you have a command of God. Um, in Israel, the parents don't have a command of anybody. No angel. Yeah. Oh, here here yeah. there is maybe yeah. an angel. We don't know. Yeah. Israeli painting would be easier to, to, to tell you quickly in one yeah. sentence than the whole literature. Mm -hmm. Angel doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. The sending uh, authority is the state. And the places, father. But the and which the father. is represented through the fa sometimes also is mothers. Is theology more than state? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is I'm Wait, sorry? But, but of course, the Israeli state, state can be interpreted. Yeah, but any modern as state. What's in America? Well, What's today, in the Many young Israelis, they don't go to the army. They refuse to go to the army. They but that's part of the rebellion. That's what we are talking about. But this yeah. is uh, not the way it should be. From the point of view of, of the existence and to of the state, you get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> 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 Thank everybody for putting up with. That's it. <laughs>